Well, hey, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi, and today what we're doing is we're talking about doubt. I've actually got a Christian philosophy professor with me today, Dr. Travis Dickinson. This is his first time on the show, and uh, what I'd like to do is let you know a, a, a couple things, uh, some information about Travis, but then I also want to let you know that he recently wrote a book called Wandering Toward God. That is what we're actually going to be discussing today. Wandering Toward God is a recent book, Finding Faith amid doubts and big questions. I've got this actually linked in the description of the video. So we're, we're going to be talking about doubt kind of broadly. That's what the, the book is about as well. So there's going to be a lot of overlap with what we talk today and some of the things that you say in the book. But first of all, Travis, it's great to have you here. And I'm, I'm glad that we were actually able to find something that uh, we could have you on for. So w welcome. Welcome to Capturing Christianity. Oh, my pleasure, Cameron, to be here with you and, and thankful for your ministry and just this channel's... Uh, reaches a lot of people. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for coming on. And just to give you guys a, a little bit of information about Dr. Dickinson. So he's a, a professor of philosophy at Dallas Baptist University. He's taught courses in philosophy and Christian apologetics for over 25 years. He's done apologetics and evangelism in more than 35 countries. He lives with his family in Fort Worth, Texas. So actually, the way that I would like to start this interview with you today is to talk about your bio on the back of your book. It's like okay. you've done apologetics and evangelism in more than 35 countries. What does that mean? I've, I've visited like maybe three or four countries total in my life. Right. Well, you know, I can't, I sort of count anything that counts. So, um, <laughs> you know, if we sort of touch down in, a, in an airport and I might have a conversation with somebody on a layover, that counts mm. as a country for me. So, but no, I was part of a ministry um, in, I was actually as a student and then also as uh, in, in right after college, in fact, uh, where we went all over the world, in fact. And so I've um, uh, been on a trip that, you know, flew out of New York City and flew back into L.A. having seven or eight stops uh, in China and India and um, Israel and uh, Thailand, anyway, all, all, all over. So uh, mostly doing evangelism. Those were sort of um, before I really stumbled on apologetics and, um, you know, went went full force into that area and then eventually into more academic areas of philosophy and so on. So, mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, talk about the book, talk about the, the topic for today. The way that I've got the, the video titled is, Is Doubt Compatible? with faith or like with right. Christian belief more generally is the, are the two compatible? And I've got some, some questions on, on this topic, but uh, first I'd like to ask you just, you know, kind of what was the uh, spark that led you to write this book and why, why yeah. did you want to write a book about, you know, doubt? And I mean, I, yeah. mean, I assume that it had to do with your personal journey and, and maybe that kind of spilled over into your academic work. And, and then you saw that th this is something that, you know, a lot of people struggle with. So, yeah. Well, you, you, you got it. Uh, it was, uh, <laughs> uh, in my own journey, having grown up in a very Christian setting and, and that's not a bad thing. Of course, it's, it's a good thing in many ways, but, um, it was a very Christian setting such that I was at, um, you know, church, of course, every Sunday we were, my parents were part of a Christian ministry. I was at, um, I went to a Christian school, um, and I did everything. I did everything that, uh, you know, Christian kids are supposed to do as far as youth group and retreats and mission trips. And um, as, as I've mentioned, and uh, it really wasn't until I was sitting in a seminary classroom, actually, um, when it just hit me. I, I, and I, I can't completely explain um, why, but we were we were sitting around. It was a class on sort of world religions and I just really felt like we were giving Christianity a pass. And it was probably just me, to be honest. It, it probably wasn't the professor in any way, but it just felt to me. And then I think what it what I what hit me was that I think I've given Christianity a pass my whole life. I've never really deeply scrutinized it and asked the questions why. And so that really just set me on the journey of um asking the deep and difficult questions. Cause I just, for me, I had to know the truth and it resulted for me in a, a deeper and greater faith. Um, so not only is it, uh, not incompatible, it's actually, um, I think a great help, a great aid to faith. Um, it, it's at least right. And we can talk about this, uh, 
if you want to uh, more deeply, but there's certainly a connection between faith and and knowledge um, and and you know rationality and our our reasons to believe in things like that. And so what I think that doubts do is it helps us to grow in knowledge. I mean, really, I mean, mm. no matter where you end up, uh, if you're doubting some belief or other, and this doesn't have to be faith or religious beliefs, um, it could be, you know, what time your doctor's appointment is next week. Uh, presumably, when we do, we lean into those doubts and we investigate, um, we come to a place of greater knowledge. Uh, and for me, what I I can only just sort of report my own testimony, and that is that that meant for me that I I. Uh, came to a place of greater faith and knowledge in Christianity. I, I found the Christian answers to be by far um, the most satisfying as I went. So I was looking at your, uh, sorry to kind of like just veer way off topic. I was looking in your background <laughs> of all yeah. things while you were talking. I noticed the Chemex back there. That's what I use when I make my coffee is a, is a Chemex. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, so it seems see, like you're like, are, are you like good. a... Are you a you're coffee connoisseur? Than me. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say a connoisseur. Uh, it has to do with only having a kettle in my office area here. Mm. And so, and not a so coffee it's, maker. It's, for looks. So it's somewhat for looks and to relate to the oh, you know gosh. younger generation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, one of the questions that, that came up in my mind as you were talking about your, your story is that I think a lot of people have this idea that doubt is something that is sinful. So that's right. that's maybe where the conflict arises, and that's why they might think that it's incompatible with faith. So let's start there, talk about, you know, whether yeah. or not sin, is, or uh, sorry, whether or not doubt is sin or could be yeah. sinful. Um, because there, there are places in the book that you talk about, like when, when Peter's walking on the water and and uh, Jesus is like, you know, you you lacked your, you know, you, you lacked faith, basically. Yeah, so why did you doubt? kind of seems like... Yeah. Why does it seems like seems like there's a conflict there, and it it kind of does like support the idea that that doubt is is in some way sinful, or at least not like rightly oriented toward God in some way. Anyways, um, let's start there. How how should we think about doubt in its relation to sin? Yeah. So uh, the one thing that I want to say, and and you know, I've, I've tried to make really clear because there's it's been it's been interesting how the book has been sort of pegged at times, you know, you, you put all this thought and energy and uh, time into uh, crafting a careful uh, work like this or book. And people say, yeah, it's a book on doubt. And it's sort of like, well, it, it is on doubt, but it's, I hope it's more than that because I don't, I don't want to overvalue doubt either. I think that's a mistake that um, is definitely made out there in the broader sort of church world where, um, Right, this emphasis on doubt and deconstruction, and you know, it's as if that's like the goal, as if that's a good in itself. And I think it's a good, but I don't think it's good in itself. I don't think that's where we end up. I think it's only good as a means or instrumentally good for uh, us to gain a greater knowledge of the truth, and you know, as I as I say, e even a greater faith. Um, so. So I don't want to overvalue doubt. Um, I, I do think it's important. I do think it's compatible. I do think it's of value, but it's not a place I want to stay. I, I, I'll say this provocative thing from time to time that I, I want my kids, right? I've got four kids myself. They're teenagers and preteens at this point. Um, and I want them to doubt their faith at least a little bit, right? I don't, I don't want them to just take it all just because dad said it you know, they believe it, that settles it kind of thing, or or whatever the case may be. I want them to doubt, but I don't want them to stay there. I want them to see it as a value and move through it. So, um, but as it relates to doubt as as sin, I think what I, what I try to do in the book is, is boil doubt down to a sort of core statement of what doubt is, like what it is really in its most basic form, in its core form, and there, in its core form, I don't think it's a choice at all. So uh, if sin requires choice, right, if a kind of ought implies can uh, principle applies, the, and, and, sin, and sorry, uh, doubt is not a choice, then it, doubt can't be a 
sin. Um, you can't say you ought not to uh, doubt because most of us, I think when we find ourselves in that, that again, core place of doubt, that sort of initial phase, perhaps, uh, we're not making the choice to do that. In fact, if we had the choice, we would choose to, you know, run from that, to not be in that state, because it's a really, it can be a really difficult place to be, as it was certainly for me. Um, however, doubt can definitely manifest, right? Because we sort of, we we find, we typically find ourselves in a place of doubt um, where, as I try to define it in the book, um, or as I do define it in the book, I, I say that doubt is when one of our belief, uh, one of our beliefs seems false. So it's a kind of seeming state. And again, we don't get much choice over the seeming state. Now we can cultivate these things. We can sort of like, uh, you know, um, create the the atmosphere for for doubts to arise and so on that's that's certainly the case but for one of our beliefs to seem false uh we don't get a lot of choice but what we do from there we've got a lot of choices how we handle that how we think of that um and i do think there's there is there are ways in which doubts can sort of manifest in to sinful behaviors perhaps um Right, I think that's what's the, what James is talking about in James chapter one when he talks about the double-minded man and so on. And, and, and commentators that I've looked at agree that, that this is more like behavior as it results from doubt, not necessarily uh, just a mere sort of intellectual tension. And, and again, that's what I think of as the core place of doubt. So it's just when, when we have some honest struggles with our beliefs, I just don't see how one puts that in the category of sin. But again, what we do from there is 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 very much a sort of morally evaluable, uh, uh, you know, state of states of affairs. And so, there's right ways to do it and wrong ways to do it. There's ways that I think are um, morally right and morally wrong, probably in some ways too. So, so one of the assumptions I think in in that argument, we'll talk about it a little bit here, is that sin is is uh the result of some sort of free choice or something like yeah. that so that 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 may be an assumption there that that I won't be shared by everyone, all, right right <laughs> there's going to be a lot of christians for calvinists for example who are going to be like sure. okay no you're even if it, it's not the result of a free choice like a, a libertarian free choice you're still uh going to be culpable morally culpable and it's it's it could still qualify as sin so wh what are your thoughts on that so someone who just denies that assumption in in the argument that uh, it's not necessarily that you have to choose it in order for it to be sin. Uh, it, it could still be sin, even if it's the result of some sort of like thing that just happens to you. Yeah. Now, one thing you said is I, I absolutely agree with, and I think there's there's we can we can do this dance uh, and, and sort of thread this needle uh, to use more metaphors here. Uh, we there's de it's definitely the case that doubt is a result of the fall in some ways, right? It's I, I think I'm very comfortable saying that that it's part of our limitations and fallenness. Um, there are certain things that we want to be the case that absolutely figures into our, our, our places of doubt. And that, that could easily arise from sinful desires and so on. I, I'm very comfortable with, with making that distinction. But um, if somebody just denies that uh, moral responsibility and moral culpability required free choice, I, I think I got to hear a little more. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I'm familiar with the, the arguments. And so, you know, there's, there's more technical discussion to be had here of Frankfurt style uh, counterexamples to this and so on that I'm happy to go into actually, but um, I, I mean, I try to at least. Um, but I think I, I can't, I, I think my response is just to say, I can't shake the intuition that you know, there's there's a few intuitions, philosophically speaking, that I that I just can't shake. It's sort of like um, leaving aside the nice, fancy, fun, uh, you know, philosoph. I don't know if everybody would think of these as fun, but the sort of philosophical theories that are out there that you know, you know, I like Plantinga just as much as anybody else, and have huge respect for him. But I don't find everything he says completely intuitively plausible. I, I come out being an internalist and thinking that evidentialism is, you know, I just can't shake. Some, yeah, I'm sorry, but uh, I can't shake some of those We're intuitions. Ending the interview. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> thanks, everybody. Uh, Blasphemy. Yeah, no. Um, there's certain intuitions there that, like, you know, I I just can't shake. Um, you know, and so for me, I know I'm getting onto another topic here, but um, rationale, the connection between rationality and evidence seems to me to be one. I just intuitively, I can't shake that connection. And and I I would say a similar thing here, that when it comes to moral responsibility um, and free choice, I just can't shake the intuition that there's some freedom of choice somewhere at some level when we find someone to be morally culpable for some action and so even if it's this weird you know admittedly weird frankfurt style case uh where a person um you know can't refrain from doing a or whatever the case may be i still think there are choices being made that make sense of our moral uh, our, our sense of moral responsibility in those cases so so there there's kind of two ways that you could have gone in responding to that one of them was okay. to like just stick to your guns and be like, no, we still need free choice in order to, to sin. Yeah. Um, and I think that's totally like respectable and everything. But um, the second one is you could have argued that even if there is no free choice, then it's still doubt is still not sinful. So um, I, I wonder, though, whether or not you agree with that conditional statement. So like if doubt is not sinful or uh, if doubt is not the result of a free choice, could it still could it then be sinful? Does that make sense? Am I, saying I that think wrong? not. Yeah. I, so I, I guess I'm I'm sticking to my guns, but not merely sticking to my guns. I'm saying that I think there's a strong intuitive pull uh, that I guess I'm hoping you and your audience share to some yeah. degree uh, for the sake of the argument. And that is that um, holding. So this idea of being sinful, if we mean it in terms of a kind of moral culpable, culpability sense, that you've done something wrong, you've done something you ought not to have done, it's very difficult for me to see how that makes any sense at all on, if there's no free choice in the matter. In other words, mm -hmm. if it's something that has not uh, been a matter of choice. So like if somebody has cancer and you say you ought to not have cancer mm -hmm. <laughs> right like or like you're, you're, you're responsible sinning when you have cancer sorry or like when you or, or accusing someone of sinning because they have cancer yeah that's right I, I think that only makes sense if there's some free choice in the mix on that state of affairs and i think again in most cases that just doesn't make sense um and so now, if somebody means it in that other kind of sinful sense of just saying like the result of the fall or the result of a fallen world or a depraved mm -hmm. world or something, then yeah, I'm on board with that. But but I don't think that there's a choice being made, typically speaking. Now, that's a little more controversial, perhaps. I mean, we're pretty controversial already, but that's even a bit more controversial that I don't think in most cases we're making choices to doubt I think we might be making choices of what we look into and what we investigate and the questions we're asking. Of course, those are a matter of free choice, um, right? That that may lead to doubt, but that something seems to us um, as a plausible objection, perhaps. That's kind of the flip side of doubt uh, or the flip side of the way I put it earlier of, of where our belief seems like it might be false. It's where an objection seems like it might be true. That's kind of the other side of the coin. But no, I think I'm just committed to saying that if doubt is not a matter of free choice, uh, being in that place of doubt is not a matter of free choice, then I don't think it makes sense. I think it's a category error to call it a sin. So let's go back now to something else that you were saying earlier about, um, and I hope I don't, I, I may have just lose the thought. So it, instead of do that, when it comes back around, I'll, I'll get back to okay. it, but <laughs> I do have something else that I did write down. So it's not as if I can forget this one. So, uh, this one has to do with the language that we use when we talk about doubt. It's like when someone says, oh, I'm struggling with doubt about this. And we, th this sort of phraseology comes a lot, comes up a lot when we're discussing Christianity and religion and, and stuff, you'll hear someone say, oh yeah, I've been struggling uh, with doubt about this or whatever else. And so, um, I wonder if you might think that that language indicates that the person who is doubting is holding that belief for say emotional reasons, because 
we don't say like, oh, I'm struggling with doubt about this scientific hypothesis, you know, that mm-hmm. I'm, like that's not the type of language that we use when we're talking about something like that. But if, we, if we're struggling with doubt, say about our, our uh, I think you gave this example in the book about our, like our, our favorite team, you know, that, that's like yeah. uh, we're struggling with, with doubt about them winning the World Series or whatever. It's like yeah. uh, you're probably like hoping that that's the case for emotional reasons, but it doesn't mean that you have like any good rational grounds for thinking that they're excuse me, that they're going to win. So I I wonder though, um, I I guess the question is, does the language that we use when we express doubt about Christianity, does it reveal something psychological about us that we're just, you know, we're emotional creatures that are just uh, sort of expressing our emotions when we believe that Christianity is true. It's not really an evidential or rational thing uh, when we're doubting in this way or use this type of language. Do you think that that when we use that type of language that it, it indicates that some we, we might be holding Christianity for bad reasons? Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. So um, I think it's Tim Keller who who characterizes doubt as it's it's almost like the antibodies of faith that it's their their doubts are there to sort of like indicate to us that there's something amiss. And so I think that it often is the case that when we have an overly sort of emotional basis for our beliefs, um, then we often, you know, the doubts that we have, and I think that's what it was for me in my own story, in fact, is that, right, this was a family thing. This was like, it wouldn't have been okay I mean, it would, it would have been okay. They wouldn't have turned me out had I, you know, embraced atheism or something like that. But, um, but I think it would have, they would have been very upset. Like it would have been a big deal if, if being a kid of ministry that, that, you know, um, that, that I had embraced atheism or some other religious view or something. Um, so I do think that's part, that's a big driver, especially for, for kids that mm. grew up in Christian homes. Um, and, and people that come from Christian backgrounds, and and frankly, people that live in Texas and in the South, where it's much more of a cultural kind of thing. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, so I, I live in Texas now, but um, it was just much less assumed to be true, is much less part of the culture. And so it, I don't know if that's kind of right to call that emotional, an, an emotional basis, but it's something like that. And so what doubts do is they sort of signal to us that it's time to take a deeper look. It's time to sort of dig in and say, what is this? Because, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody who was saying that there that a, a time that a time of doubt for them was when they watched the uh, Zeitgeist movie. Mm-hmm. And I've heard other people talk about like, you know, like the Da Vinci Code uh, uh, books or movies, and that really caused them to stumble until they looked into it for like half a second and realized that these are all like fictional, you know, barely historical. Um, like there's just not, if it's historical fiction, there's not much history in them. Um, yeah. And it was kind of like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm cool, I'm good, you know, but notice what we've done with that is we've been forced to look at the reasons and kind of come to that come to that place. But um, I actually, you know, I, I might push back just a little bit and say that I do think that there are, uh, I think that doubts do come up for scientific theories. And I did, I think it can make mm. sense to sort of uh, have our doubts especially about for someone whether who's like, theory. Especially for a scientist who is putting forward yeah. his own theory. Like right. he may have doubts about Because they're invested theory. in it too. And there's a community it's aspect to, them. to it. And they're their uh reputation a little bit is on the line at times at least in some of these you know some settings like this and so i i have, think so but again what i'm and i think there are emotional versions of doubt um i remember there was a there was a student of mine that um she just had the biggest heart in the world for people and and she was she we, we actually did a mission trip together and she just came back with her she was really struggling in her faith for why God would allow, because we were in, you know, pretty poverty stricken area. Mm. And she was really struggling with um, why God would allow that. And, but it wasn't, it wasn't an intellectual struggle. It seemed to me as, as we talked, it was, she, she could give me, she could pass my philosophy of religion test, you know, on the problem of evil or whatever. But uh, it was just like that, sort of seeing the faces of these kids 
who are just in these deep states of of suffering that mm. will, and i think that's more emotional and it really is but uh emotional doubt and um gary habermas his books focus much more on emotional doubt and uh it's really kind of like that way in which um you know you might know everything there is to know about getting on an airplane and why it's safe and and perfectly trustworthy uh and reliable and safe way to to travel but you might have a fear of flying like you might have a phobia of sorts and uh i honestly i don't know what to tell you <laughs> if that's i mean i i, I want to i'll walk you know with my student i tried to walk with her with compassion and and just you know uh uh help as best i could but my training is in the intellectual area <laughs> and i wouldn't recommend me for marriage counseling either to be honest um right my my area is to sort of like lay out an intellectual problem and do my best to sort of uh you know address it and analyze it and evaluate it and so on but i do think that uh i i gotta think that what would help somebody with a fear of flying is to be reminded of those facts and what would help somebody who's struggling with like a kind of emotional or existential problem of evil is to be reminded of the intellectual facts and uh work on those at least again i i can only sort of give my own story and that as i've experienced the emotional side of it i i feel like our emotions tend to get in line I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a uh, Plato guy on this, I guess, that our emotions get in line when we kind of get the intellectual part of our souls figured out. Okay, I I, uh, I remembered what I was going to say earlier. Okay. Are you okay if we kind of, okay. Yeah, yeah. If you're yeah. off course again. Well, not not off course. We're still talking about doubt. Sure. So uh, I was thinking about something that you said earlier about the, the sort of value of doubt and how you even made the comment of, uh, you, you hope that your kids will doubt, you know, as, yeah. as Christians. And so I w it got me thinking about like, well, okay, what is the value that, what, what are we getting at when we're doubting that that is valuable? And so I think there's kind of maybe two things that we could be getting at when we doubt and, and doubt if we just interpret it as like uncertainty about something that we hope is true or, or believe in or whatever. Um, so on the one hand, doubt might indicate that we're seeking the truth. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that it might, that it might indicate. But another thing that it might indicate is that we're wanting to avoid false beliefs. That's a distinction Liz Jackson makes a lot on the channel too. Is that like, there's two different things you could try to do. And one of them is, or not only two, but there's, there's two yeah, things sure. you could do. Yeah. When it comes to beliefs and doubt and uncertainty and everything is, is uh, on the one hand, you might be trying to avoid false beliefs, but on the other hand, you might be seeking true beliefs. And so the, the question I've got is when it comes to doubt and uncertainty. So like I would be, a little bit hesitant to like want someone to doubt if their goal was to just avoid false beliefs. I would also want them to be courageous and try to have as many true beliefs as possible. So mm -hmm. I would, I would want to caveat when I, when I would like tell someone, Hey, I want you to doubt. I'd be like, no, actually what I want you to do is really seek the truth about the matter yeah. and it, not just try to avoid false beliefs, but also try to obtain true beliefs. And in that whole process, doubt might be part of it, part of that process of, so I don't think that you're necessarily going to disagree with that, but I just think that, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a, it's maybe an interesting distinction to make about the, the value of doubt and, and what the ultimate goal someone might have in doubting. And, but both are important, right? I mean, it's not right. like you, you only want to do one and uh because i think they can well i think what happens is that yeah. skeptics often will really only try to I avoid see. false beliefs i see and yeah. so they'll th so that what that leads to is is skepticism about everything because yes. you, you want to avoid as, as many false beliefs as possible yeah but then on okay. the other hand and what theists do i think or they try to do is they try to have true beliefs and so yeah. but you can value both you know you can value avoiding false beliefs you can also value obtaining true beliefs so i, I think uh, just to clarify, I think that you you do need to have both, but it, in the process of doubting, doubting can can be used as a sort of tool to to have a sort of balance between the two of those, and uh, I, I, and this also I think is also related to to certainty, which we haven't gotten to certainty yet. But. Yeah, yeah. So I have a chapter in the book, um, a, a sort of intended to be a guide to question well, because like I said, I, mm. I I'm not this is not all about doubting uh, for me. I really would want my kids more than I want them to be doubting. I want them to be questioning. 
I want them to ask questions as honest seekers again. Mm -hmm. And so I give as the sort of two uh, uh, ends of the spectrum that I think are mistakes, right? If the, if the virtue is in the middle, uh, the two vices, I say it as, uh, you have fundamentalism on one hand where we don't ask any questions and we're, we're really not, it, both of these will are vicious in a way because they are not seeking after the truth. I think how you put it is kind of, so I think what I'm about to say, I think really goes along well with what you're saying there, at least I'm, I'm hoping so. Uh, right. And then the other extreme, the other vice would be to what I call being a skeptic, which I've already had various, uh, uh, online personalities sort of poke fun at this, but, um, right. Cause I would dare to say anything against skepticism, but, um, I think there's skepticism, then there's skepticism. I mean, what I mean by skepticism is where, you question everything and no answer will do, which I think is probably tracking with that distinction. You're, you're questioning to avoid falsity, but you're never sort of like putting forward a positive claim. Like you're, you're questioning to, to tear down, but never satisfied with the answers that come. And, and I do know a lot of people who are skeptics of that sort. Uh, you might call them extreme skeptics or radical skeptics or something, but, um, and I think it really does Where, just come down to like that person just really values avoiding false beliefs as opposed to valuing attaining true beliefs. So like I think just so a, though I would you're maybe a little more optimistic than I am but on that. I I think that a lot of times they they want to avoid believing certain beliefs. And so mm. uh it's not a it, I think it you know what I mean like I think that there are some people who no amount of evidence, no amount of argument no i mean they'll say they're all about the evidence but then you lay out the evidence and they sort of shrug their shoulders and yawn and walk away um and i i suspect their questioning is just to sort of be you know roadblock you know put roadblocks there to avoid having to believe um and i think in the bible i mean i you know in the bible i think there are you know, when you look at the ministry of Jesus, there were people who were honest in their questions and Jesus would like stop everything he's doing to uh, address the questions or sort of walk with that person through those questions. And then there were the religious leaders, Pharisees and others who were questioning too, but, you know, he would call them brood of vipers and, you mm -hmm. know, and but so, so sometimes he did refute what they had to say with logic oftentimes I'm, i think matthew 22 is a really good example of that so i think that's that far end of the spectrum of you know what we again might call like radical skepticism or or something like that um where again i think in in an honest pursuit they're trying to avoid falsehoods in a less honest pursuit they're just trying to avoid believing anything at all Let's uh, let's turn to talking about certainty because we haven't really talked about okay. that yet and, and the, the relationship between certainty and doubt and whether or not, you know, as Christians, there was someone who uh, I was talking with recently and she was telling me that she's absolutely certain that she's going to be in heaven one day. And right. um, my initial reaction to that in my head was like, I want her to be less than certain about that. <laughs> I want her to like right. to question that. And so yeah. um, let, let's talk about certainty and its relationship to doubt and uh, Christianity and certainty as well, and, and the overlap between the two. And do, do Christians have to be certain about their beliefs? Yeah. No, they don't. <laughs> oh, you want me to say more? Um, okay. Uh, look, so certainty, you know, all these things are, are you know, terms that we, are, we will give definitions for. And so is there a sense in which um, someone can be certain about the things that they believe. Yeah, of course. If we just mean something like our minds are made up. Um, but I think the what I sometimes I'll sort of prefix it, especially in Christian settings where people start to get really nervous about, uh, you know, arguing against uh, being certain about Christianity. Um, I'll, I'll prefix it with absolute certainty, if that makes anybody feel better. What I think that we don't have for most of the things that we believe in life, this isn't just as a matter of religious faith, um, but in life, we we fail to achieve the level of absolute certainty. Now, I do think, and it's worth pointing out that there are 
there are definitely ways in which there are there are some things about which we can be certain. And, but I would say, you know, those things would be like two plus three equals five. Um, right. The law of non-contradiction. I think we can, know, you know, the logical laws, the, the uh, principles of mathematics and things like that. There's definitely some of those things that we can be certain about. And I'm with I'm a big fan of Descartes. And I think Descartes right that, you know, I think therefore I am or or as he puts it, I am, I exist. I think we can be certain about our own existence even, but we don't get much further than that on even a, you know, very generous reading of uh, Descartes um, meditations. And so what I think we have to do for all the rest of what we believe. So, but I, so then what, so the things I don't think we have certainty about is I don't, I don't have certainty that, um, you know, everything I'm experiencing right now isn't some sort of computer simulation or I'm in the matrix or, right? Those things raise the possibilities. Now, I start talking matrix and one that's now outdated with uh, most of my students at least, um, right? Though they did have matrix four. So I feel like I can still talk about the matrix a little bit, but which wasn't worth seeing. But anyway, uh, um, right? If, if those sorts of things that everybody you know, kind of rolls their eyes about, um, do legitimately raise the mere possibility of being wrong, then we don't have absolute certainty. Um, and so, right, it, it, the best we can sort of have, and, and what's interesting is that when I talk to especially students, uh, you know, like my college students and high school students, oftentimes they're kind of on board with this. Like this kind of makes sense to them because the, the things, they, they've just had these experiences through their lives where things that they took themselves to be certain about, perhaps, you know, that a certain pastor was, you know, a faithful person and then some scandal comes out. Like they're kind of just live in this world where they're used to having these like cherished beliefs be dashed and, and so on. So like they, they live in a much more uh, less black and white world, much more uh, gray, and they're pretty comfortable here. But I think we should all sort of get there because I think when it comes down to it, um, you know, if we look at First Corinthians 15, of course, uh, Paul will say, uh, if, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our faith is in vain. And I think what Paul is doing there, in some ways at least, is sort of raising at least the mere possibility that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And then he's sort of tracing out what the implications of that would be. It's not like he's talking square circles or two plus three equals four. Uh, he's saying if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and that seems to be clearly possible that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, like conceivable, uh, certainly conceivable. Um, so then if it's conceivable, if it's possible, then we don't enjoy absolute certainty as it relates to that. So then I am comfortable to say that I am not certain, 100% absolute certain that Christianity is true. But please don't tweet that out. Please to you know make sure you have the context of everything I just said. Uh, but I am, I'm happy to say, a hundred percent confident that Christianity is true. And I think that's a really different. That's a big difference. And uh, as you said, there's a there's a whole chapter of, the, of this in the book. And um, my worry, honestly, is that when we aim for certainty, absolute certainty, all it takes is one single question. Uh, one unanswered question, and that whole thing comes crashing down like a house of cards. Um, but if it's confidence we're aiming at, then I think that tolerates all kinds of questions and doubts and struggles and so on. So long as we, we remain confident, then right we have a rational basis for placing faith in uh, our Christian, um, in Christ, ultimately. So I, I think that uh, when it comes to certainty, I, I think people, there, there's actually a lot of cases where people are certain about certain things that they probably should not be certain right. about. Or at least because take themselves he, to be certain. Yes. Um, well, no, I, I think that they are like certain okay. about it. I think that they are, they, they are certain, for example, that Christianity is true. But um, as you kind of said, like one of the things that you can do is, is just ask, you know, when it comes to a lot of propositions, and even in the book you talk about, like, because Christianity is a historically grounded religion, yeah. it's rooted in history, 
there is the possibility that on a historical basis that it could be false. Yeah. One example is you could find the bones of Jesus, or if you could find the bones of Jesus, that yeah. would be one reason, one way that Christianity could be false. And as Christians, in, in Paul, it seemed like he was open to that. He's like, if Christianity is not true, then we're to be pitied uh, most among everyone. And so yeah. it, it kind of seemed like Paul was on was on board with that notion that it's possibly false. Doesn't mean that it is probably yeah. false. Doesn't mean that it, yeah, right? And so... Um, but I think it's also really important just to reemphasize what you said here is that if like, if you, your Christian belief is all about certainty for you, it's like you either have certainty, Christianity is like a, a switch, like it's either on or off. Yeah. You either got right. certainty or if you have any uncertainty, you're done. Like you're out. Yeah. That is going to be a very fragile Christianity. It's very, right. very fragile. Right. But if you come at this from a philosophically informed perspective, like, okay, Christianity is just like a whole lot of other beliefs that we're uncertain about. And it, it doesn't mean that, that those beliefs are false. Like, okay, here, another example. I'm not certain, 100% certain that the sun will rise tomorrow. I can't right. be because it's possible the sun could just stop existing. It could go dark. It, like there's, po it, it's possible Okay, but that doesn't mean that it's actually likely to happen. It doesn't mean yeah, so, and that we would put any credence whatsoever in the belief that it that it will. Right. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Like All recognizing it means is mere that it's possibility possible. doesn't doesn't mean we we're, we're we're inclined towards it, thinking that it's likely to happen. You know that, that that's uh, yeah. I think that's an important point. Well, uh, another thing is that um, and this is kind of like talking psychology a little bit. I think it might give people security, like a sense of mm. security, if they if they're certain about Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so, if if they're led to believe that oh, I actually can't be certain about this, then they might lose some of that security that they have in yeah. their Christian belief. And it's so that little, might it's, it's not as messy in a way. It's kind of like. You know, it doesn't leave loose ends. If it's if it's about certainty, it just kind of it, like you said, it's black and white. Yeah, and so I think that might be one of the worries there for for a lot of people yeah. is that like when you actually when you actually do that, then you do have to entertain the possibility of being wrong. You have to entertain yes. the possibility that you're not going to see all your friends and family and everything in the afterlife. Like that that whole possibility becomes open to you. And this actually is kind of a good segue into uh, the next topic that I wanted to to discuss with you, which before I get to that, I do want to let you guys know that we're going to do some Q&A in five minutes or so. So, or however long it takes us to get through this next section, maybe maybe five to 10 minutes. But um, the reason why I'm even talking to you about the, the Q&A that's coming up is because now's the time to leave your questions in the live chat. If you're watching this live, let me know if you have a question for Dr. Dickinson on the topic of doubt and faith. Leave it in the live chat now. I will make sure to uh, keep an eye on it as best I can and ask it here in about five, 10 minutes. So uh, related to the whole question of, of like, suppose that like, I think it might be the case for a lot of people that their certainty about Christianity is rooted in, in some sort of like, um, well, like I said, it's like a security or something that that's a mental health issue. So, some people that I, have reached out to me because I've, I've been very vocal about anxiety, dealing with anxiety and depression oh, on sure. my channel. Yeah. And I've had people reach out to me saying that they just have so much anxiety about like apologetics and you know, the possibility of being wrong about all this and the possibility that some argument that you've been defending for years is wrong. And uh, it, it just gives people a lot of like worry and anxiety. And so I think a lot about the overlap between doubt and mental health and like yeah. the relationship between anxiety for example, because if you read any book on anxiety, like J.P. Moreland's got a great book. I think it's called Finding yeah. Peace or Finding Quiet or something like that. And uh, he, he puts a like he he he's just great on anxiety. He, he's dealt with anxiety his whole life too, so he's he's life. just great on it. Yeah. But but um, he talks about catastrophizing. That's like the number one thing that a lot of people do mm -hmm. when you when you struggle with anxiety is that you catastrophize. Mm -hmm. So you take one remote possibility. Yes. And because that one possibility would be so bad if it were true, that is giving you all this worry and anxiety. And so it might yeah. be the case that someone out there is holding that Christianity is absolutely 100% true because then if it's not, 
that opens yeah. a possibility it could be wrong. And, and, and so that could be maybe at, at play here. And so let's just talk kind of openly about the, the overlap between doubts, anxiety, mental health, all yeah. of that. What are your thoughts? So, uh, yeah, that's why I say again, this, you know, as a philosopher, I'm uh, not well trained to address anxiety and things like that. And I think, but in philosophers, I think tend to say like, you know, bring it on, like bring it on, bring on these possibilities and probably make a lot of people suffer uh, in our classrooms um, who, who struggle in this, in this area. And so, so sorry about that, but um, no, but uh, right. Um, you know, part of me wants to say that, uh, now I, I'm speaking to the Christian audience. Um, if we think Christianity is true, uh, I take Christianity to be true. I've, I've given my life to it. That's why I say like, is it a is it an area of absolute certainty? No, it falls short of that. But I'm I'm very comfortable, and it it is messier. And I think that's part of the point that you're bringing up is that part of the messiness that probably a lot of people don't realize is for those that um, really truly suffer in a sort of mental health sense um, as a result of the messiness, right? And so, what do we do about that? Well, again, I'm I'm not probably well qualified to say, but I guess what I part of what I want to say is to say there are so many answers. Like there are so many good um, cases. You know, I mean, we really do live in a very privileged time, and that that's a understatement, of course. You know, in terms of technology, I mean, just the fact that we're able to be on a YouTube channel right now uh, talking about doubt is points to our privilege. But I think that. Um, the availability of sources that are out there on these issues. So again, that's why I say I, I have a hard time knowing what to say for somebody that has a fear of flying, but I got to think that focusing on, um, I, I think the fear of flying must be a lot worse if that person really is convinced that, that flying is unsafe, <laughs> right? Like I would hope that getting the answers that actually getting on an airplane is very sa safe overall um, would would at least help uh, those anxieties. And so I guess I you know, um, you know, Wittgenstein comes to mind in, in talking about philosophy as being therapeutic in various ways. And I think he had a particular thing in mind, but I do think that philosophy and apologetics and these things are in a way therapeutic in the sense that they as we as we see our way clear, because that's why I say when it comes to my own children, especially, I don't I, I I want them to doubt their faith only because that means that they're genuinely questioning and seeking and pushing in. Um, but I want them to find their way clear on some things, because once they find their way clear on something, then they have that confidence to sort of face down other challenges as they come, and so. I don't know if this is a good answer for somebody who's really in the grips of anxiety, but um, I, I guess I can at least sort of, you know, make that claim or, or attest to the fact that I really do think Christianity can handle your questions. And so I, I, I feel like it's, and I've had other people sort of say like, don't you feel a little scared here? Like telling people they should question and doubt, you know, that doubt is okay. And, you know, what if people walk away? But it's like, well, I don't know. What's the alternative that we just pretend like there aren't these issues and questions and that's never worked for me. And that's what I say. I think for our, uh, you know, kind of younger generations, like my kids are definitely kind of Gen Z and even millennials, like they're, they're, they're questioning is just part of the, you know, part of their outlook of life. Um, and so, if so a bad pairing is to have parents who are just saying and pastors who are just saying hey don't doubt <laughs> you know as if that's helpful don't doubt uh and kids are saying well i'm asking these questions and i don't have answers to them i'm kind of struggling with this and the parents are saying don't doubt it's like no wonder we have statistics as high as 60 to 80 percent of gen z are walking away from the the church at least in college 
is because they haven't found safe places to doubt their faith. And I think if churches should be anything in a way, they should be safe places for us to come and ask those really deep and difficult questions and find some help and not just be told to knock it off. Yeah, and um, I, I wanted to sort of tag on something that I talk about a lot on this channel. I've, I've mentioned a lot, and uh, you, you may, if you're watching this, you may not have heard this before, and that's why I try to repeat it every time that I, I get a chance to, is that your, uh, your doubting Christianity could be the result of sort of untreated or undiagnosed anxiety. And I, I know this because there are some people who reach out to me and tell me this that they're struggling with something. And I'm like, okay, well, how do you actually feel? What What is the experience like when you're doubting this? And it has all of the hallmark, hallmarks of just straightforward anxiety. And so yeah. what I always recommend is if this is a source of anxiety for you, if you're willing to admit that, then what you need to do is instead of like, try to figure out why you're why you have all these anxious thoughts, that's like the worst time to try to like do any kind of objective yeah research into whether or not Christianity is true, whether there's any good objections to it or anything like that. The best time to investigate the truth of something is when you're not experiencing anxiety about it. So then the question becomes, how can I get over my anxiety when I, when I deal with these issues? The answer might be, you need to go talk to a mental health professional. Like that might l literally be the thing that you need to do, get control of your anxiety and then return and investigate and, and do all the investigating that you that you want to do about yeah. it because it, it could be uh one in five adults struggles with mental health issues so it could be that for you that's what you're struggling with and, and you may need a little bit of help it's it's okay yeah. to admit that you need some help and it could really like change your life change everything for you if yeah. if you take that's control not. of your anxiety first and then tackle these big issues and ask these big questions yeah and one thing i just so I think that actually fits something I do say in the book, but I I'll, I think that you hit on something that's super important that I really don't talk about enough in the book, um, but where it could fit. So when I, I give kind of a strategy, and I almost hate to call it that because it's not like it's five steps to not doubting your faith or something, um, right? But I do give a kind of like, strategy of how to approach doubt. And my number one thing that I say to do is to hang on, just hang on in your faith and honestly try to get, try to get some emotional distance, uh, with the, with the doubts, because I think doubts, even if it's not a whole level of anxiety that you're struggling with and so on, um, it's a, it can be a difficult and lonely place to be. I think our doubts do make us feel really lonely and we feel like we've just stumbled on something that nobody else has seen and it's worth tapping the brakes if not you know screeching to a halt and just saying let me just and this is this is what i wanted to say that i make sure this comes out that for any of your your listeners or or, or people who are tuning in here um it and, and one of the big message of the book is just to say look if you're doubting your faith um you're normal <laughs> like it's it's mm. you're normal like that's that's part of the discipleship process, um, I think. I, you look at the life of the disciples, and I mean, they had intellectual tension all over the place. And so if that's what it is to doubt, like, and now, did was that good? Was that like, they, they've like, you know, achieved it? Like, you no, know, in many cases, it was like, they shouldn't still have in intellectual tension where it was popping up. But y you are normal. And in fact, I think if you're struggling with doubts, uh, you're probably more courageous in a way because you're willing to kind of take a look at some of these things where some of your peers mm. might not be willing to do that. And so, man, I love it. I, you know, I, I want somebody, I just, I just think we, I, th I think the church doesn't end up being a very safe place to doubt your faith. And I think that we often kind of don't, aren't guided well in how to go about it. And anyway, that's what the book aims to do. So anyway. Yeah, let me mention one more time the the book that we've been talking about. If you're just now joining us, Wandering Toward God, Finding Faith Amid Doubts and Big Questions. My guest is Travis Dickinson, Christian philosophy professor. And let's now, what we're going to do is turn to some Q&A. So we've got a couple questions that have been queued up here. And uh, so we have Parker's Pensies here with us. Parker said a case. No 
Uh, do you know him? I, I've done his podcast as well. Okay. Okay. Yes. And uh, he's <laughs> he's got some interesting, as you can imagine, some interesting okay. questions for you. Hit so, me. yeah, you're going to be hit. All right. Here it is. Number one. <laughs> Ask him if doubt results more on externalism or internalism. So super philosophical question. Uh, th this episode so far has been not deep into philosophy, but we're about right. to go as like as deep as you can. So well, okay. let's do it. Uh, does doubt result more on externalism? I, I, I kind of think unhelpfully both uh, uh, in, in the following way. So I think where if I'm trying to sort of read into Parker's uh, great question here, um, my guess is the, 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 the worry or the suspicion might be that on internalism, um, you know, we, we are going to doubt more because we need to have like, you know, just to make sure everybody's clear on what internalism even means. Uh, internalism is a view in epistemology that would be to say that, uh, right, our beliefs and if for them to be um, reasonable or justified or warranted, there has to be um, um, facts of which we are aware that's doing that justificatory work. Um, whereas ex the externalists would say, no, there could be facts that uh, justify or warrant our beliefs of which we're not aware. They're external to our sort of first person awareness. Um, and I, I think the suspicion would be that internalism uh, sort of leads to doubts more because we are looking around for our reasons internally and we might not find them and, and, and it's gonna cause us to doubt. But I guess, uh, man, if the external. Uh, by the way, I think I think that's a yeah. really good interpretation of his question. So. Of the question, okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought you were going to help a little more with like how to answer. No, uh, uh, no, because I'm an externalist, and I, like as someone who endorses okay. reformed epistemology, I'm like, yeah, I, I I think that it can handle doubt better. So. Well, here's where I so if so, Planninga comes to the end of his trilogy even uh and then you know his his you know huge contribution to philosophy to uh, epistemology and and the end of it is if christianity is true then our christian beliefs are very likely warranted mm -hmm. right and, and and so and again i i don't know if i'm quoting that perfectly but it's that that kind of thing and i'm left with more doubts in a way than I started with, with that kind of statement because, or, or I could be, a person could be because it's conditional. It's saying if Christianity is true, which is kind of like, for me, so deeply unsatisfying that it's hard for me to kind of take the whole rest of the contribution. I mean, I take it seriously, but it's kind of like, if that's the conclusion that it's this conditional claim that if Christianity is true, then it's very likely warranted. I'd need I I need something a little more than that. And again, this kind of comes to my intuitions about um, the connection between reasons and and evidence. But um, right, the whole point of it, in a way, was to know whether or not Christianity is true, and so to just sort of help ourselves conditionally to that it leaves me and I and I know many others have sort of made this point very strongly. Uh, deeply unsatisfying and so if that sort of deep unsatisfaction is at least could result in a kind of uh place of doubt that i i don't know that externalism in, in almost the devaluing if i could put it that way though of course like this is this is probably not a very charitable statement given that many externalists don't devalue what i was gonna say devaluing of evidence um, you know, I mean, Planiga and, and a guy like William Lane Craig, uh, he's technically an externalist as well. He would be a reformed epistemologist of sorts, but he sure spends a lot of time defending the evidence, uh, right? Bill Craig does in his debates and things like that. So he's not somebody that devalues it, but I do think that there's a tendency probably to devalue the evidence. And so if I'm just, just supposed to say like, if Christianity is true, then it's very likely warranted. I'm not sure how that addresses any of my doubts to start with. And I think a turn to the evidence is really where um, one finds help. And so I don't know. I, I kind of think it could be equal. One way to answer the question is that it's equal, 
but I, I, I'm worried about the externalist approach for really addressing the doubts that we have mm. um, because it's sort of like, hey, you know, anyway, just that conditional claim at the end just sort of doesn't really do much for me. Yeah, uh, the, my, my thoughts on it are basically when it comes to reformed epistemology specifically, because reformed epistemology is just the thesis that you don't need to have arguments in order for your beliefs about God to be rational or justified or warranted. So it's, it's, a, it's really a claim about arguments. So they, they, that you don't need arguments uh, necessarily. So it, but it doesn't mean that you don't need like experiences or seemings or anything like that. So the way that I would view this as... You see, but of, that wouldn't be externalism then. It'd defining, be, well, re defining reformed epistemology that way where seeming states and experiences are doing the sort of epistemological um, heavy lifting would be internalist. So I see... Uh, I've never, but no, to be I, honest, I I've, never liked, I've never liked defining reformed epistemology that way because okay. that would make me also a reformed epistemologist because I certainly don't think... Uh, that well, then you're just a reformed epistemologist. <laughs> and that's fine. Again, it's terminological, but I would be an internalist, yeah. evidentialist, reformed epistemologist. And, and you know, I'm not so sure I, what effect that would have on planning a, if he heard those things strung together. So there's obviously like there's there's one expert in the room and it's not me. So I could be <laughs> completely wrong about this. But the way that I view internalism is that it's it's only about internal states. So I think yeah. as I, like, yeah, I, I could be. be wrong about yeah. that. Yeah, There I is a version of it that would say that, but I think that, okay, I, I think the best way to, to, to make the distinction is between what kinds of things, or, or sorry, uh, the awareness of facts. If you require the awareness of facts and those facts could be internal states or one could be a direct realist of sorts and, and the external, so, you know, or um, yeah, external states if you're aware of them, could be doing justifying work. Um, but anyway, go, go ahead. You've got I, to, I yeah, you but, but you've got to be aware of them. So my, my, I guess my point was that if you have any external factors that are like doing any kind of justificatory, justificatory work, then it seems to me like you would endorse externalism, but but the, I, I don't want to get off topic here because yeah. I feel like that's yeah, a way yeah. that's we're yeah. getting off topic. Yeah, um, it's Parker's the point fault. that the Parker, I, we all blame you, and he has another question here that's like even crazier. So, um, <laughs> but uh, the point that I wanted to make was that if you take the reformed epistemology stance, that it, you don't necessarily need to have all of these arguments for your beliefs to be rational. One of the examples that planning it gives, obviously, it, it, it's like the most. Uh, well-known example that he gives is like your belief in other minds that other people exist. Like you don't have the set of arguments that, that like this premises that lead to deductively to this conclusion that, okay, other minds exist that you, you probably don't have that. You just go out and experience the world. You like talk to people and you form beliefs that, okay, this person that I'm talking to has a mind. Um, but the point is, is that when it comes to, to doubt and everything, like I can see how on the reformed epistemology view, if you deny that you've got to have arguments, and that would work on on internalism, I think as well. That's why that's why I prefer reformed epistemology as opposed to like the externalism internalism distinction. But if that were true, then that would seem to alleviate some of the worry there that you've got to have access to all of these really good arguments in order for your belief in Christianity to be warranted or justified. So if you if you rejected that, if you were if you were a reformed epistemologist, that would seem to me like to to be something that would sort of alleviate some of the doubts that that could arise. But, so is are you saying that well because Planninga tells me that uh and again conditionally so that my Christian beliefs are warranted because what I don't ever find out I don't, I don't, and I don't even need to find out on the externalist view is mm -hmm. whether or not I am a properly functioning, you know, um, if my faculties yeah, are properly functioning. You don't have like a and second so, order knowledge. And so I don't have, I don't end up with assurance. And that's something I talk about a lot uh, in, in various philosophers um, of the internalist variety talk about more so is the need the sort of desideratum of um of intellectual assurance that that's really what we aim at in epistemology and so 
to take assurance from the reformed epistemologist's account, I just don't see where that's coming from. It's sort of like, oh, don't worry, because if you're properly functioning, then your belief is very likely warranted. It's like, well, I don't know if that's much assurance at all. I, I want to know, am I properly functioning? Because even by that very statement, it entails the possibility that I'm not properly functioning and that my belief is unwarranted. And then my doubts come back, you know, even, uh, you know, uh, more extremely in a way. This is part of why I, I, I like to separate reformed epistemology from the internalism, externalism debate. I, I'm convinced okay. that you can be like an evidentialist reformed epistemologist. There's a paper by Trent Doherty and someone else who yeah, I, think it was, right. I think it was someone else. Yeah, that they they talk about that. And so I, I would eat, like yeah. what what I would. Yeah, what I would. Um, sorry, my dog is barking in the background. It's like oh, throwing right. me off. Um what I would want to focus in on would be like, just just think of some similar case that like the belief in other minds. Like you okay. can have the assurance that you have that that there are other people based on your experience of interacting with them and and the beliefs that you kind of notice that form naturally in those experiences, yeah, yeah. Those, those circumstances. Yeah. So that's what would kind of give you assurance, not necessarily some arguments. Right. I yeah. think that would be evidentialism. So that wouldn't be. Yeah, and I'd be um, okay with that. I'd be okay with that as a reformed epistemologist. It more evidential than it does uh planning which it, it again that's fine if mm -hmm. if we just want to talk about not having arguments because i'm i'm way on board with that as is yeah i i don't know the the problem the way the reason why i don't like that distinction in part is because i don't know anybody that says well th that's probably a little strong but th it's very rare that somebody will say no in order to be rational you have to have deductively valid arguments for your beliefs. I mean, that's that's virtually nobody that I know, like most of the evidentialists, internalists, my thesis advisor, Richard Fummerton um, from from Iowa, when uh, my days at Iowa, um, right, um, Bonjour. I mean, I can't think of any of the sort of classic guys that would be extremely at odds with Planiga in his view who would deny that they would all fall under reformed epistemology. I, in fact, I asked somebody one time, like, who's your, it, that was making the, the definition that way at, in a paper. And I said, who, who denies that then? And there, and that person couldn't come up with anybody either. Again, there probably is somebody and maybe Descartes, but even Descartes, I'm not even sure um, Descartes would, would not fall into the category of, of reformed epistemologist because somebody like Fummerton would argue that um, we can have knowledge about our pain states, and it's certainly not on the basis of an argument. It would just be on the basis of being aware or acquainted with our pain. And so Fummerton is a reformed epistemologist. Like that just seems odd. To, the, the distinction doesn't seem to really uh, you know, make much of a distinction if you do it just on the basis of whether or not arguments are sort of playing a big role or not. Okay, I'm going to leave it there because we've gone right. off topic for quite a while. Yeah. And and, and Parker has another uh, bombshell. <laughs> so here, here's the next one. Ask him if your trans world counterparts oh. are your epistemic peers and if their doubts should reduce your own justification. <laughs> I'm going to go with no and leave it there. Okay, that's fine because we can move on to more questions. <laughs> I mean, I think you'd have to, of course, be aware of your counterparts, and there's a there's a whole sort of apparatus here that I think would have to be spelled out. Um, but the the issue of epistemic peers is interesting, right? Where someone mm -hmm. um, you could have an epistemic peer who um, who finds something. He asked, as I recall, I think this came up in our podcast on his 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 uh, channel uh, months ago for my previous book. But anyway, um, uh, epistemic peers. So I don't I don't think that as an objection. In other words, I think it's harder to establish somebody as a genuine epistemic peer than it looks um, because we do even trans world. If we're going trans world here. Um, uh, or counterpart theory or whatever, uh, 
I, I don't think that um, it's easy to say when somebody is an epistemic peer or not, because we're just so complicated and it really just takes any little difference of experience, different of difference of sort of, um, I, I, I like thinking about like plausibility structures, like the things that we're, we're willing to count in as evidence and, and give credence to and those sorts of things. Um, I don't think, I think we're so very different that I don't think the, the mere fact that somebody who is similar to you is struggling with a particular area should necessarily be a problem for you. I think we kind of have to take all of these cases case by case and ask, I mean, if somebody finds themselves in a place where they don't, it turns out they don't have good reason to believe what they take themselves uh, or, or taking as true, then yeah, then maybe they should have doubts, but at least press in and try to answer those questions and shore up uh, their, the, the sort of rational status of that belief. Okay, so one more question. All of these questions are very philosophical, so I, that's not what I was expecting. Nice. But let's uh, let's do this next one, and then we'll close it out. We've gone a little over an hour, so this will be our last question for today from James. Question: Do you doubt? Uh, do you think that doubt proves our consciousness is contingent upon a necessary consciousness with absolute knowledge? Um. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, proves would be a little strong, of course, for, for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm the doubt guy, remember? Um, right. Our consciousness is contingent upon a necessary. I don't know. I don't know that it um, It might. I think it does this, certainly. Um, well, what do you think about consciousness arguments in general? Do you, yeah. do you I mean, think that they work? Or I do think, I think the argument from consciousness in a cumulative case for the existence of a you know divine consciousness uh or or a divine being i i love those so if, if that's what's being asked but it seems like it it's it's saying something about doubt and may I, I wonder if if james has in mind something like descartes uh you know methodological doubt where um where um Descartes is, you know, tries to doubt everything he possibly can and see what sort of comes out the other side. And he, so he doubts that, you know, his, he exists, he doubts that he has hands, he doubts, you know, all the sort of deliverances of his senses and comes down to realizing that even if he's doubting, um, he must still exist. Like there's an I doing the doubting, there's a consciousness um, that's, that's experiencing doubts. And so that even the mere doubting of our own consciousness, uh, proves our consciousness. And then, and then, so we've got consciousness at least on board. And so then we, then maybe we can make claims about divine consciousness. I'm not sure if that's where, uh, James is sort of thinking there, but that that's certainly interesting to me. Um, um, uh, right. Uh, I, and I do think I, this, the, the verse came to mind. I'm not sure if this has anything to do with the question either, but um, where Paul in first Corinthians um, now first uh, Corinthians, I think it's 13, 12, where it talks about our sort of, um, really talks about our epistemic status as humans. And our epistemic status is one of which we are seeing through a glass dimly, or, or some translations put it as like see in a mirror dimly. So that our perspective on reality is really one of like a, of a pale reflection, of a dim reflection. And so it's sort of like, of course we're not gonna, of course we're gonna have doubts along the way if that's our epistemic relation to the world, um, we're, and, and again, that brings up this idea of fallenness that we talked about earlier. Um, we are just in this limited perspective, this limited state, uh, but there will be a day, you know, that, that Paul spells out in first Corinthians 13 there that it says that we will know in full. And I don't know what that all means, but I, I assume that, doubts won't be as much of a sort of issue for us, um, right? And it also says that we will be known in full. And I think that's a really beautiful picture. Again, it's like, 
it's a has huge epistemic implications, I think, uh, you know, sort of biblically. And so um, anyway, um, and, and I don't know if that helps that if that's like encouraging for someone who's who's struggling with the anxiety. I guess I you've really put that in my mind here as something that's really important to address. Mm. Um, but no, you know, it, there's a hope. There's a sort of intellectual or epistemic hope that we have that though we see through a glass dimly now and we have to sort of muddle our way through our questions and doubts and, you know, hey, uh, not to keep promoting, but uh, wander a little bit uh, as we go on this journey. It's a it's an intention, intentional wandering. That's why I, the, the title of the book is a sort of nod to uh, Tolkien, a Tolkien quote. Uh, that that's on t-shirts everywhere, but, uh, not all who wander are lost, uh, is what Tolkien put it as. And I think that's really beautiful. I think that's really describes, at least for me and my journey is that it's this sort of, it's a journey, it's a true journey. And it's not this sort of straight, like, here's obviously, you know, the way we go, we sort of have to feel our way through and wander our way through, but it is a intentional wandering, uh, hopefully toward God. So let me mention one last time. You just put the book back up, but I'm going to put it back up. So wandering <laughs> toward God, finding truth or finding uh, faith amid doubts and big questions. That is the uh, book that we've been discussing today. I've got it linked in the description of, uh, of the video for your convenience. I wanted to ask you, because you, uh, I normally ask my guests at the very end of a show, I'm like, hey, is there anything okay. that you didn't hit on that you wanted to hit on? I felt like you kind of just did that. Okay. But yeah. Um, I, I So it's, I'm going to ask you a different question. What what other topics are you do you like that really interest you that you would like to come back on and, and talk about? What would that be? Oh uh, yeah, I love um, you know the religious epistemology stuff. I think is um, so. It, it, I'm in the very very beginning stages of thinking about this, but I, what I want to do is write a sort of something of a part two of this book and it would be on what it is to come to knowledge right so if this is mm. if this is the wandering and how to sort of uh you know handle doubts and questions as they come what is it to sort of get through that and what is it to come to that place of genuine knowledge of god um but you know my my um there's a lot of guys working a lot of men and women working on this that um do it on a real high technical and academic level. And my heart's been to try to bridge some of that. So this book is written very excessively, I, I hope. Um, at least that was the intention. Yeah, and it was. So that, that's what, with this new one, I would want it to be very, um, very accessible as well. Because there's a lot of material on religious epistemology, but it's often so technical that it's not a, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like people not trying to read, to a lot of people. you know, trying to be blessed by planning a, uh, it's not always a blessing. And so, uh, it, even though it, there you go, talking, talking bad about I'm my sorry. guy again, oh, it's really, I mean, I, again, I have such respect show. for him. I could have <laughs> said Swinburne. I should have said Swinburne. Sorry. You should have. Uh, Swinburne too, wouldn't have, been, it isn't always a blessing when we dig into it. Um, it's worth it. It's worth reading, but I think there's a need to have that sort of, uh, made more accessible too, in, in connecting to our, our faith in a way. So, yeah, I think religious epistemology is definitely something that I would love to, um, think with you and Parker and whoever else wants to jump on, uh, awesome. uh, more about. So awesome. And, well, Travis, thanks and, for coming and, on and do my best to sort of like direct you and at least provide other alternatives to the reform, <laughs> you know, approach. Well, I don't know that you'll do that because you actually agreed with it today. So we'll see. Yeah, that's true. That's right. Um, <clears throat> okay. Yeah, no, today's been awesome. Uh, th the topic of doubt, we don't really talk about it that often, but it it's been good to talk with you and kind of get a, a different perspective on it. I think that's been, nice. been really good. So Travis, well, thank you. It's, been, it's been good yeah. to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Cameron. I really appreciate it. Any, I, I know I said I wasn't going to ask you, but is there anything you'd like to leave with the audience? Well, I mean, you I, know, I well, think... Maybe what you could do is, is answer that in terms of like, where else can they go to find out more about your work, that type of thing? Yeah. So, um, well, one of the things I was going to say is just the importance of our sort of posture in this. So just getting back to more serious issues, perhaps, of uh, people who are struggling with their faith and things like that. I, I really do think our posture is so important. Um, if we have the posture of a skeptic, 
I don't know that we we will always find the truth because we're just not going to be satisfied by the answers that we do in fact find. And and of course, the posture of a fundamentalist isn't going to work either. That we just ignore these things and just you know, uh, Bible says it, I believe it. That settles it. Um, sort of posture. I just don't think that works well. I think we we want to have the posture of a seeker, as as you put it, a seeker of truth. And I really come back to Matthew twenty two uh, on this where. Jesus is asked what the most important commandment is, and he says to love God. But he says it as love God with all of your hearts, souls, and minds. And so it's it's another way to so, sort of put it that we should be asking the deep and difficult questions, loving God with our mind, not as skeptics, but as um, lovers of God, like those that are seeking to know and, and love him. And I think that makes a huge difference um, right, we're doubting precisely and asking questions precisely to know God in a deeper, um, a deeper way. And so, but yeah, my website is travisdickinson.com and you can kind of get all my, my stuff there. I, I blog there from time to time and, um, put out material. So there you go. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you next time. And, uh, yeah, it's been awesome. So see you guys next time. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?